I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Latin America. I am here with my wife, Dominica. Hello. And we are in Buenos Aires, Argentina. We're going to be talking about how and the problems of exchanging money and getting money to be able to work while you're here in Argentina. Of course, a lot of you are going to be looking at coming here as travelers, but you may be looking at coming here as expats or digital nomads as well. And especially if you're going to be here for a long time, dealing with the Argentinian peso and getting access to it as a foreigner is a bit of a challenge. So we're going to talk about that because a lot of people have questions and we've learned a lot while we were here. So we're going to get to that right after the bump. In one of our recent shorts, we talked about my trial of going to an ATM and seeing if we could withdraw some money. Now, we're American, so our bank accounts are from the United States. Even though we live in Nicaragua, we use American banks for the most of our finances. It just makes a lot of sense because in Nicaragua, we can use American banks transparently, as you can in most of the world. It's generally not a big problem. But for those who are not aware, Argentina has been going through a a financial crisis over the last several years, and they are at currently the world's highest inflation rate. So they have a lot of things going on that cause some problems. That's under the hood. It doesn't really affect you on its own, but what does affect you is that because of the inflation and an attempt to control that inflation and to keep the economy from collapsing, because the economy is actually humming along decently well, if you're just walking around on the street, you would have no idea that there was a financial crisis going on in order to prop that up and make sure things keep working. They have to make sure that funds don't just flow out of the country willy nilly. And so because of that, it's really difficult to actually bring money into the country. It's not impossible. It can certainly be done, but there are many challenges to that. And one of the biggest ones is limitations on the ATM, which is why I went to the ATM to try it out because we know we hear these stories of, oh, the ATMs don't work, but they kind of work and everybody has a different like. So we wanted to actually put an American card in, try the ATM and see what's actually going on because this stuff changes all the time. Right, information from six months ago is pretty much not that useful today. And unfortunately, this video will only be super useful for about six months. It won't take very much time before a lot of things have probably changed, especially because the new president is now in place and is starting to actually get his policies going, right? Like he was elected a while ago, but he can't make changes on the first day very effectively. So it takes a little bit of time. So we're seeing those things roll out. So that's likely to be something, just be aware if you're watching this in the future, we may have some good background information for you, but you'll need to make sure that it's getting up to date. I will try because I have people here in Argentina. I will try to keep this updated in the future with new videos in case anything changes. But also be very aware when I state exchange rates on this video, they won't be good in two weeks. So that's it just gives you kind of a baseline of like understanding how it works. Don't look for it for real numbers. In most places, like Nicaragua, when we say the dollar is 37 to 1 with the Cordoba, very straightforward. 37 Cordoba to the dollar, that'll be good for years, and when it changes, it'll be 37 and a half. So you have a really good idea. Here in Argentina, those numbers change day to day. This is hyperinflation, so you can't really predict what it's going to be. If we watch videos from travelers who came to Argentina just a year ago, a year and a half ago, they're talking about completely different prices for things than today. It's not even, it doesn't even seem like the same place because they'll be like, oh, this cost a hundred. And we'll be like, wow, that cost a thousand. Right? The numbers are just bizarre. So that's a background. So going to the ATM, I ended up paying a $10 ATM fee and getting a bad exchange rate to take out $20. In reality, less than $20 is worth about $16. So it was a terrible, terrible uh, exchange, 50% fees. And we don't even know if there's other fees that we're going to get hit with in the future. Just just terrible. So basically, the ATM could be used for extreme emergencies. That's about it. I was able to take out $20-ish, a little bit less. Uh, but importantly, I tried to take out a little bit less than $100, about $80 to $90, and it wouldn't let me. So that's important to know. I don't know what the limits are, but they are a bit less than $100 for sure. So that's important to know that you could get a few dollars, but you're not going to be able to probably pay for a nice dinner. You're probably not going to be able to pay for uh, an apartment or anything like that. You're not going to be able to pay for hotels. But if you need to get enough cash to maybe take an Uber somewhere, you probably can. If you can find an ATM, they're around, but they're not anywhere near as frequent as we've seen in other countries. We had to search around a little bit. It wasn't terrible, but we did have to put in some effort to finding one. So just be very aware 
that you can't rely on ATMs as a backup for cash, and even if it, the rates were terrible, the way that you can in other countries. You can't get enough money from ATMs to do things effectively. I would just like to say that you don't actually know why you couldn't take out that amount, because what if it was just that that ATM was almost out of money. That's so possible, So you only yeah. tried one, because that happens to me in Nicaragua a lot, that I'll try to That's take true. out Cordobas, or I'll try to take out dollars, and, like, Cordobas won't work, dollars will, dollars won't work, Cordobas will. I'll go to a different machine, and I'll put the exact same number in, and I'm able to get money out. So you don't true. actually know why. The difference, though, and this is worth noting, is that is true. There is the potential that it is something like that. The machine did give an error that the amount of money being transferred had been exceeded. Okay. And the machines here only deal in Argentinian pesos, so they don't have this dual, like the inside of the machines don't have dual currencies that they have to dispense. They just have one massive amount. But, and we'll, this is, we're going to talk about this, the, the actual physical currency here in Argentina. Do we have some bills that we can show? They're probably in my pocket. Boom, magically we have some cash. Okay, so we wanna show what the denominations are you're likely to see here currently. We've heard a rumor that the central bank is attempting to print larger bills starting maybe next year. Not super large bills, but larger than they currently have. Here's one of the things about hyperinflation that actually becomes a really big problem is that the way that bills are designed, if you're an American or a European, you're used to bills that make a lot of sense. A single $1 bill is about the smallest thing you'd ever actually want to carry. Change is annoying, and you generally don't want something that small, especially now after the recent bit of inflation in the US and Europe, you don't want anything smaller than a single one, whatever the unit is, euro or dollar. And when you get big ones like 20s and 100s, those are useful large amounts of money to carry around to actually pay bills. If you're going to take the family out to a nice dinner, carrying one or two $100 bills or five to 10 $20 bills is a bit of paper, but not a big deal. It's very easy to carry around amounts of money that make a lot of sense for normal transactions. The way that the bills are printed is based on what is practical in day-to-day -day life. Because of hyperinflation, Argentina doesn't have that anymore. They now have a number of bills floating around that are so ridiculously small that they have essentially no purpose, and their largest bills aren't large enough to accommodate normal daily transactions. So this is something that people don't really think about. Of course, if you search around, you'll find people talking about it. But in general, when people are talking about the financial problems in Argentina, no one's talking about the physical supply of money not being adequate to do normal things and the bills being the wrong sizes. These are super weird problems. We saw this happen in Zimbabwe, I believe, a number of years ago when everybody joked about it, but the same thing's happening in Argentina. So you need to be aware that the money isn't just difficult to deal with, it's incredibly weird. So let's start by looking at the largest denomination. This is the biggest bill. If we were in the United States and we said, we're gonna pull out the biggest bill that the United States prints, this would be a lot of money. This would be like an amount of money we wouldn't be comfortable carrying around, and we certainly wouldn't be showing it on the show. We'd be running to the bank to cash it in because we want to put it somewhere. But the largest bill that you can get in Argentina is what came out of the ATM for me. It is this, the 10,000 peso bill. This is nice looking money, right? It feels nice, looks nice. It's, uh, it's quite nice. So the current value on this, and we're going to talk about the exchange rates in a little bit. So we're just going to talk about the official bank rate, and we're gonna round numbers. This doesn't, it, it changes every day. So it doesn't really matter. But at the time that we're doing this, this has a official bank and government value of roughly $10. And so right now, at the moment that we're making this show, we happen to be at the point where it's really, really, really close to 1,000 to one pesos to dollars. So if you're looking at anything, just take the thousands off the name and that is what you have in value. So this is a $10 bill. Not really true, but that's what we're going to say. So this is about a $10 bill, the biggest thing you can get. So if you wanted to pay for something that would be the value of $100, you need 10 of these. That's not the end of the world. If you can get 10 of them, a lot of people can't. A lot of things cost more than $100. So that can be challenging. What you find an awful lot of is these, the 2,000 peso bill, or about $2. But as you can imagine, if you're paying for something, even something that's only $60 to $80, you need a lot of these. And you're going to spend a lot of time 
counting them when you go places to pay. What you find just unbelievable mountains of are these, the 1,000 peso bill. So this is roughly $1, and we've had to pay for a lot of things, a lot of meals that are in the 40 to 60,000 peso range in stacks of these. This literally gets to the point where it's challenging to carry it around. We have gotten and changed some things that are pretty small. We're just going to show these quickly because this gets pretty goofy. This is the 500 peso, so this is worth a little bit under half a dollar. This is the 100 peso bill. Yes, it is a bill, and it is worth just under a penny. And this is the smallest one we've seen. This is the 20 peso bill. It is worth less than one-fifth of one cent. And yet, here it is. In the United States, we're talking about why we need to get rid of the penny, maybe even get rid of the nickel, because they're so small, they're completely useless. Why bother striking them? Round things. Here, they are still giving change in the less than a fifth of a penny. Five of these does not equal one U.S. penny. So if you had these to actually pay for something, you would have so stacks just so large. It, it would be absolutely absurd. So everything you're doing is with bills like this. So that is the first challenge that even when you manage to get money, it is in such wild denominations and you're going to have such stacks of it. And there aren't enough of the 10,000s to go around. So <laughs> there's just a shortage, like a physical shortage of bills. So the 1,000s are what's being given out in abundance. So when people give you money, they may give you a box of money. And then you've got to figure out how you're going to deal with it. So that is one challenge that you just need to be aware of. Now, in all of that, we talked about what that was worth. But we got to talk about the actual exchange rates. Because unlike most countries that have a single exchange rate or a very basic set of exchange rates, uh, there's sometimes a buy and a sell rate where you buy at one rate and you sell at another and that's how everyone makes their money is the difference between that but they're close enough that you're able to have a middle ground that's considered the exchange rate and everyone knows that is the number so for example in nicaragua we're used to 37 to 1 so it's just 37 to 1 but the reality is on the ground you're going to pay 36 point something or 37 point something depending on if you're buying or selling and where you do the transfer because different people charge different amounts but there's a basic exchange number that it's all based off of. You're in Argentina, that is not true. So here, there's a huge number of different exchange rates. There's the official exchange rate as set by the government. I don't know who uses that or why, but the government publishes this number. There's another number that's much more useful. It's known as the bank number. This is the one that if you go to a bank, they're going to give you. It's very reliable that you will get that. It's what you're expecting to get in an ATM or anything like that. That number, at the time that we checked it, is 950 to the dollar. So basically 10,000 to the dollar. I'm sorry, 9,500 to the dollar. Basically 10,000. It's off by a tiny bit, but it moves day to day. So that's why we round to 1,000, because that gives you a really good number to work from. So when we're saying that a 10,000 peso bill is worth $10, it's based on the bank rate. There's a whole bunch of other rates that I don't apply to normal people. They're used by institutions in very specific circumstances. But if you're looking at an exchange thing, they'll be like, all these numbers, it's crazy. Other than the bank rate, which you may end up using if you have to do anything in an official way, uh, I believe there's a separate one that's based on the bank rate that's actually the credit card rate, and it's really close. Those numbers are so close, it doesn't really matter that you have to talk about them. But don't be surprised that the rates aren't quite what you look up. It also changes really fast. The rate that matters beyond the bank rate is what's known as the dollar blue. And it's become famous because this is the world's highest uh, uh, inflation rate for the last few years. It is a massive global economy. So this is not some little tiny country whose economy is like, okay, someone's gone haywire and their money's crazy. And we're all just like, okay, this is a massive economy. This is, uh, you know, over 40 million people in what not that long ago was the world's richest country. Uh, there's just a lot of monetary impact here. So the fact that their rates are going crazy is really getting a lot of attention the outside of Argentina. So the dollar blue has become really famous. I've been told or hinted at that the name comes from the fact that people working in the dollar blue are generally exchanging and really want 
the $100 bills from the United States, just because when you're working in large amounts, that's the bill that you can actually get that people know, but is big enough for major transactions. So it has a blue stripe on it. And so the entire transaction has become nicknamed the dollar blue. By the way, we're drinking mate. We've assimilated to the whole Argentinian lifestyle. Okay, so <laughs> the dollar blue exchange rate Currently, at the time they were saying this, when we used it, it was about 1,290 to the dollar. And we've heard that yesterday it topped 1,300, which it moves pretty quickly, so that was not surprising. So about 1,300 to the dollar, which is between 30 and 35% better than the exchange rate you get from the banks. Now, better if you're changing U.S. dollars into pesos. You would want to do the opposite if you're going the opposite direction, right? And that's one of the reasons that people do these things is, is there's ways to make money and then that's why they control it in arbitrage. But the uh, 1300 plus rate gives you way more money. So when I'm showing you the 10,000 peso bill and saying that's worth a dollar, that's the bank rate. But if you were actually to bring in $10 and exchange that on the street and get the dollar blue rate, you gotta be careful. If you exchange on the street and don't make sure you're getting the dollar blue, you're gonna get the bank rate, right? So you gotta be careful about that. So if you do that exchange and you get the dollar blue, you're gonna get a lot more than 10,000 pesos. You're actually gonna get over 13,000 pesos, about 13,100. And so when we say that, that that 10 is worth $10, it's not actually, it's worth quite a bit less, around about at this time, $8. So the largest bill on the market is actually, when you're considering the true rate of exchange, just $8. And the most common one is just 80 cents, not even $1. So we're paying for large dinners in a stack of 80 cent bills, as you can imagine, a really big stack. Even though things aren't that expensive here, it doesn't take much for 80 cent bills to add up to a pretty big stack. So how do you get these exchange rates? Well, there's two major ways. One is if you have the contacts, you can have an exchanger actually come to your home or you can meet them somewhere and they will give you the best rates. This is how you get the absolute best, but you have to know people. And we do know people. We gave this a try. We never managed to, to get make contact with the guy. So if you're going to be doing that, chances are you probably need a bit of time. I'm sure your experiences will vary. You may come and have someone you know, and they're ready to go. You're going to get here and they're going to exchange the same day. The person we were dealing with doesn't work weekends, took vacation, and basically we never managed to make contact the whole time we were here. But that's okay. There is an alternative that gives you almost as good as rates, and it's just a little bit less convenient because you need to travel. There is a traditional shopping street that is now very much a tourist center called, I believe it's Avenida Florida. Something like that. It's something Florida. I think it's Avenida. It is a pedestrian way full of little shops and a lot of, it's really good to just go shopping, but it's kind of touristy, so you're not going to get great rates on things. But as soon as you step onto the street, it is now famous as the street of the money exchangers. Now, keep in mind, to the best of our knowledge, these are very unofficial. We don't know the details of what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do. They definitely have people standing out of the street screaming all over the place, cambio, 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 which means exchange and you can just walk up to one of them and they'll take you somewhere to do an exchange but you need to make sure you're getting the dollar blue and dominica has some warnings for you um i would not call them they're not screaming they're going cambio 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 like they're saying it maybe they're it's not, not super loud because <laughs> like, it's not legal so they're not screaming it but maybe it is legal we don't uh, really know Everything we probably I've heard not. Is, yeah, it, it's not legal. It's it feels very like the street feels very shady. Yeah, it's it's definitely a this is odd, but it's also weird because everybody knows that Florida Avenue or whatever is the money exchanger street, and they're openly saying it very obviously to anyone who walks onto the street and a lot of people. So, if it's illegal, it's illegal like selling DVDs in Chinatown in New York City. Uh, That's exactly once what it, it is, feels like. Right. And once it's what you do, it's an entire part of the city dedicated to that business. That it's illegal on paper may be the case. It's certainly not illegal in practice <laughs> because it is the industry of the area. And they, if they wanted to shut it down, they would just walk into the street and immediately shut it down. 
So it appears to be, to the best of our knowledge, that they want to make sure that tourist and the casual money exchanges are happening at the bank rate. This gives the country a lot more money and stems the outflow of cash out of the country during a time when there's such bad inflation. But it allows for people who are long-term tourists, digital nomads who are actually putting in the time here, expats who live here, or locals who need to bring in U.S. dollars are able to, with a little bit of effort and a little bit of don't ask, don't tell, get a reasonable exchange rate and not lose all of their money to the banks. It seems to be a working system, but it's super inconvenient if you're a tourist coming in for the first time and don't know what to do, don't feel comfortable going to a money exchanger on the street who you have to kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, go somewhere with. It's, it's shady. It definitely is. I've been told that if you go with one of the people that's just standing there, usually they bring you to another location and a different person and like you follow them. And it's exactly um, the experience, for example, in New York City with the DVD, 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 DVD with the counterfeit DVDs. Like well, those people have the DVDs on the street. It's more of the purses. It's oh, like, oh, yeah, I want like a counterfeit or, purse. Or the Rolexes, like right. anything, anything counterfeit. But it, it just, it, that's what it feels like. It feels yep. very shady. Yeah. So it definitely, it definitely feels shady. And it's not a fun experience to do, but it's what people do. It's not a big deal. Uh, so we went, went to Florida because we didn't have the guy come. Uh, we just took some cash. Don't take outrageous amounts of cash. It's not the cash you're taking that's the problem. It's the amount you have to take away that's the problem. It took both of us. Like your purse was packed. My Could wallet. Not fit another bundle I had, of. I had a coat, packed. coat like my real coat, the coat I wore in the last video we did together, it has big pockets because it's like a not a winter coat, but it's like a heavyish coat, and it was just pockets full of wadded up money. Like it was crazy. So that's if you brought in like a thousand dollars all at once, you'd better have like a briefcase to carry it away in. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> We had over 300 1,000 right. peso bills. <laughs> it was crazy. So <laughs> It really, it's like, and it, it just, it feels like paying for things in $1 bills. Which is totally what you're doing. So yeah. every time you go to a bakery, you're just counting these out. And you're like, did I really count out 30 of these? Right, for something. And then, okay. So we went, and, and you can go to the people who are saying cambio, cambio. Or you can find, sometimes people will catch your eye and they'll just take you into a shop or whatever. If you know someone here, it'll make life a lot easier. They'll know people and they'll, they'll just go with you because they have to do it all the time, generally. But you can go to Florida on your own. It is what people do. Um, so, and thank goodness Argentina has one of the lowest violent crime rates in the world. So you're generally pretty safe. Um, but don't bring tons of money when you do it and pay close attention. Uh, so, and, and like bring somebody with you. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go alone. Don't, yeah. Don't go alone. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's the dollar blue. And that is really important. If you're coming to Argentina, if you're just here for one or two days, maybe don't worry. But if you're going to be here for any amount of time, we're talking about a 30% difference in your money. So yeah, you come in for one day. Oh, you know what? I'm going to spend $200 for my one day. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to waste a bunch of time saving some, you know, 30 to 60 bucks. I get it. But if you're coming in for a week or more, that's going to be a lot of money. And doing one time an exchange to make it good for a week or two is well worth it. If you're going to be here for a month or something, you would be crazy not to do it first thing. So it's worth, you got to know it ahead of time. And it's, it's really severe. There aren't workarounds. Everyone immediately is like, well, can't you just, can't you just, can't you just. And if you know what you're doing and have things set up, yes, maybe you can. But if, for example, someone uh, said, well, it sounds like what you need is Bitcoin. And when people say this about Nicaragua, generally it makes no sense. Well, when you're talking about Argentina, it does make sense. So this is a great suggestion. If you had it set up ahead of time, if you already had uh, a Bitcoin wallet and you had a way to put money into it in your home country, it appears, I have not tested this yet, I plan to, so I want to report back in the future because this is potentially a great way for doing this if you set up things ahead of time, is to have a Bitcoin wallet and you can go to a Bitcoin ATM here in Buenos Aires and just take your money out at the basic, it's not the dollar blue, but it's basically the Bitcoin blue exchange rate. Uh, and, and it should be very easy. We've heard that it's easy. It makes sense that it's easy. It should be easy. Now that we know that the Bitcoin ATMs exist, we didn't know that before. Uh, but I haven't verified that they're still operating or anything, but they should be. 
So that is a potential if you set it up ahead of time. A lot of people mention Western Union. Western Union, as well as Bitcoin, are good if you're sending money you already have abroad and you're trying to deal with how to get it here. And when we were testing the ATM, that's really what we're testing, how to pull money from abroad, not how to exchange money. Money gets exchanged in the process, but that's a more minor thing. If we could just withdraw, say, $100 US from an ATM, we could go exchange that on Florida. So there's two challenges. One is getting the money here. Generally, most people recommend, and I think we would too, unless you have a really good Bitcoin system and it's been verified to work ahead of time, um, bring cash with you. Bring American cash with you. Specifically bring $100 bills. Yes. Make sure it's, yeah, that's something that nobody told us. We knew to bring cash and we did. They want $100 bills. They don't want 20s and smaller. So make an effort both just to make it more convenient for you. It's going to be smaller, but bring more than you're going to need, more than you think you're going to need, but not an absurd amount more. Uh, and so if you're going to be here for a week, you know, oh, bring a thousand. You're going to be here for two weeks, bring 2000. Don't go overboard. You can use your credit card. If you need to go over just a little bit, then it's not a big deal. Um, and just remember that you, there pretty much is no country where you can bring in or, or cross country borders with more than $10,000 in cash on your person. And if you get caught, it is a crime if you don't declare it. So that's the, the undeclarable right. amount is, is under $10,000 in the U.S. Know, it is the total amount you're bringing in, not just the cash. So if you were to bring in cash but also have some gold on you, it could be deemed to be over $10,000. Never bring exactly $10,000 worth of cash. Always leave enough buffer room for the clothes you're wearing or something. They Officially, those things are not counted as currency, but you might accidentally have like a ring on that they count and they say, oh, that's worth several hundred dollars. Therefore, you're over the 10,000 declaration limit and it's forfeit. And that's 10,000 U.S. Every country I know of in the world uses the 10,000 U.S. value limit. Uh, so it doesn't matter what you put it in. Um, it doesn't matter how you do it. You're not allowed to go over a border with over uh, 10,000 at a single time. Um, it is the it is the global money laundering limit as agreed to under some international money laundering uh, agreement. So that, that is a standard. So and we do have a video on it. Be that. under it. Yeah, make sure you're under that. Um, but if you're going to bring in cash, definitely bring $100 U.S. bills in cash with you. That will solve most things, and all you have to do is exchange in country. Okay, so in theory, that should explain how the exchange works, why there's multiple exchange numbers, why the dollar blue is the number you need to be looking for, how to exchange either with a person or have a, a trip to Florida Avenue or whatever it's called. It's easy to find, trust me. Um, why you need to bring $100 bills in U.S. denominations in most cases. I don't know how easy it is to work with euros and some other things, so be aware U.S. dollars are known to work. There may be things you can't exchange. So, so unless you verify from someone that you know you're able to bring in, say, a 100 euro note, that probably works. But I can't vouch for it. Make sure you're bringing in 100 dollar bills, U.S. denomination, and you should not have a problem. Don't go over 10,000. If you do, declare it and expect some some hassles. Uh, and uh, avoid credit cards whenever possible. Um, uh, by the way, they will accept things like $20 bills at the exchange, but typically you do not get as good of a rate. You get the best rate when you're using $100 bills. Exactly. They're going to charge you extra or they're going to be unhappy or maybe not deal with you. So <laughs> if you have them, yes, ask, but be aware that they, and if you're doing a ton and it's like, and $20, probably not a big deal. But if you bring a stack of 20s, they may be unhappy. The other big thing that you need to know, and this is actually surprisingly big. So one, there are a lot of credit card fees. So places don't want to take credit cards if they can help it. So it's a very standard thing. We don't see this very much in other countries. Here in Argentina, it is really common that you're going to get a discount if you're paying in cash or just a separate price entirely. So a lot of the places ask you ahead of time, are you paying with cash or with card? They'll have different prices listed for this reason. And it's just completely open that they are doing 
uh, this discount. Some places advertise it like out front. So we were at a restaurant the other day, gave a 10% discount if we paid, but we had another one we went to Ciudad Tigre, uh, far outside the city, and the place that we ate at had a, had a sandwich board out front with a big ad that said discount 20% for cash, right, in Spanish, of course. And so this is worth noting that if you get the dollar blue, you're getting a 30% decrease on how much it costs to get the peso. And if you're going to a place that gets like 20% discount on your bill, you're looking at a total, it does not come out to 50% before someone jumps to that. You can't just add the numbers together. It's far less than that, but it is in the 40s. It's something like 44% discounts in some cases. So we looked at some of our bills and it was like, here's what the listed cost was. And if we were to translate that into US dollars at the bank rate, we'd be paying like 60 something. And instead it came out to $40. And so it's really important because the, the combination of course, you could do a transfer into cash at the bank rate to get the bad transfer rate and still pay in cash and get the one discount. And you could go to a place that doesn't give the discount and get the dollar blue and get the other discount. But if you're living here or putting in a bit of time, putting them together, when people are looking at the things we're spending and looking at the, the uh, receipts or whatever and seeing a number, you could see we could go to a fancy dinner, the receipt, we've never seen anything like this, but it could say 100,000 pesos. You say, okay, at the bank rate, that's $100. That's expensive for dinner, but we see that in the United States, that's not crazy. Here, that would be pretty extreme. I know places will hit that, but it's really high. I think the highest we've seen for the two of us with everything, tax, tip, alcohol, was like 60,000 pesos, about that. So 100 would be really high. But as an example, if you went to a place that was 100,000 pesos, but they had a 20% discount, when the bill came, it would actually only be 80,000 pesos that you pay. Well, that's a lot less. But if you got the dollar blue exchange rate, instead of that 80,000 pesos being roughly $80, it would be a lot closer to, and I hope I get my math right, right something like uh, $56. So at the end of the day, if you're doing all this right, you're doing this every day, this is incredibly significant. You get a bill that looks like $100 and you end up only spending $56 to pay that bill, that's gonna add up really fast, just a couple days of that, and you're going to notice uh, that you're working in cash at a good exchange rate. And that's sort of a best case saving scenario. But no, we really did have it happen. Yes, yeah, we did have it happen. And, and basically all that to say, it, <laughs> despite how uncomfortable it was for us to go to Florida Ave or whatever it is, um, it was worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's so very uncomfortable. if, just if, uh, it. if you're traveling, obviously you generally have a little bit more flexibility, but a lot of my audience are looking at the potential for relocation. They're considering this as, as maybe a long-term hope, maybe, maybe a year, maybe for forever. And of course, at some point, those exchange rates are going to get worked out. This crisis is not going to go on for forever. And once that gets ironed out, all of this will go away. It'll be back to normal. But in the meantime, yeah, if you're just looking to make it a short-term stay, if this stuff sounds like way too much headache for you, this may not be the country for you. But if it otherwise seems like a right fit country, I don't think these are things that should be barriers for you. Just be aware they are a headache you're going to have to put up with. We have, we're we here because of a friend of ours who moved here and she puts up with it all the time. And it's very frustrating, but she's learning how to get better and better at it. And pretty soon it's going to be fixed because she's been here long enough and figured out what she needs to do. But uh, when you're looking at it from a cost of living perspective, which is what a lot of people are watching what we're doing here to see the cost of living comparison, uh, it's, you have to think of it in these terms that the bills you're seeing, if you, if you see us get a, a restaurant bill and it says 40,000 pesos, it's easy to look and say, well, that's about $40. We know it's rough, but $40 okay, that seems a little bit expensive or more expensive than I thought it would be. Certainly not expensive. Even at full price with no discounts and paying with credit card, it's still a very affordable country. But when you say, okay, but if I lived there, I would get this discount. I might get this other discount. There's all these cost savings that happen. It may be looking 
dramatically more expensive than it actually is for someone who's living here full time. And I think what we're finding is that if we were actually to live here and actually have our processes worked out, have our money coming in on a reliable basis, uh, getting an exchange that we do in a planned way with a person giving us really good rates, not have to go down to Florida Ave each time, it's easy for us to see how this is actually really cost competitive with a Nicaragua, with a Colombia, um, just more complicated. Those countries offer you low cost of living with incredible amounts of simplicity. Yeah, like I don't, I don't know at this point because the ATM <laughs> was a debacle. I don't know how you reliably get more money than what you brought with you. Right. The things that we believe are the case for that are Western Union, but I think that doesn't exchange for you. So you're, you'll get pesos without a problem. As far as I know, Western Union is reliable. I've heard that from lots of sources, both my viewers mentioning it, other YouTubers talking about it, and my own friends who live here do it. So that has been reliable over time for people. So that seems like a good thing. But you're not going to get the best rates. They're getting the bank rate is what I've heard. Um, but the recommendation that we heard about getting Bitcoin, that is probably the workaround. But it only works if you have a means to either already have Bitcoins. Obviously, that works. Or have a way to get your money from whatever your source is, U.S. banks or Canadian banks or whatever, into Bitcoin, have it in a wallet, and then assuming that the that the ATMs work here with a good exchange rate, that should be a way to take it out. It feels like really good information to me, but I have not yet verified it. So, so please wait till we verify or find someone who has actually verified it that you can trust. But that seems like the answer to solving the entire how do you get money from the United States to here on the blue and actually get all those benefits. That, that does seem like it's probably the case. If it works, which we cannot right. confirm. Cannot confirm. I, I do want to test and I have the mechanisms to test. So we're going to give that a try. I can't test while we're here because I don't have a Bitcoin wallet that isn't blocked here. That's one of the problems is that, and be aware of that, that a lot of the applications that work in the United States will be blocked when you're out of the United States and vice versa. So you got to test a lot of things and it's not something I've used for travel yet. Um, but there is, so we live in Nicaragua where Bitcoin is useless. Like you're allowed to use it. It's completely open, but it has no efficacy. But El Salvador right next door, it's super useful. So we want to do some testing and depending on the country you're in, and we want to see how that works in Argentina. So I want to play with a couple different things so we can bring you that information because it really is potentially an important bit of information that we haven't been able to test yet. So I want to test that, but be aware, I tried to do some testing here and, it, and we're blocked because we're Americans in Argentina. It didn't let us do anything with Bitcoin with the stuff I tried. So important important to know that these things have to be set up ahead of time and tested under the scenarios that you're going to use it for so thanks for joining us like and subscribe uh if you would be so kind and help support all this work we're doing you can buy us a coffee there's going to be a link right up here buymeacoffee.com slash scott l miller that comes directly to us help support the work that we're doing we have a lot of cost we have to refill these mate cups every couple hours it's it's really wears on you. And uh, we need to buy cameras and, and software and all kinds of licensing to be able to do this. It really is a lot of work. We love doing this and your support really helps make that happen. We're not a sponsored channel. We depend on you guys because we bring neutral information. We're not selling anything. So that makes a lot of difference. Thanks for joining us. We will see all of you tomorrow.